paramedic must have very extensive knowledge of the heart, both the anatomy and physiology and the electrophysiology. As I always say, to understand what's wrong with a patient, you've got to understand how things work normally. We've learned in the past that the heart has the mechanical function and the electrical function, and they've both got to work together in order to provide a, a pumping system. Without the electrical system, the mechanical system, or the myocardial cells do not receive the stimulus to conduct and therefore will not pump. In this lecture, we're going to learn about the two basic myocardial cell types, the function of the cell groups, uh, the four primary properties of cardiac cells, the major electrolytes that affect cardiac function. We're going to describe the movement of ions, describe the cardiac depolarization and repolarization cycle. We're also going to introduce some new terms to you such as refractory periods, absolute and relative refractory period. So to start as a review, remember you've got two types of cells in the heart. You've got the myocardial cells, which are your muscular cells. They do all the work. They're the ones that contract when they're electrically stimulated to provide for the pumping action. Primary functions are both contraction and relaxation. Physical contraction in myocardial tissue generates blood flow. Then you've got your pacemaker cells. The pacemaker cells themselves do not have the ability to physically contract, but they generate and conduct electrical impulses down the conduction pathway of the heart. So we'll call these the conductors. Their primary function is to generate and conduct the electrical impulses. They have the ability to create electrical impulses without being stimulated by a nerve, which is a unique property. There's four primary cardiac cell characteristics. You've got three electrical and one mechanical. So your mechanical is contractility. This is the ability to shorten and cause contraction in response to an electrical stimulus. Automaticity, which is very unique, it, it is the ability to spontaneously generate electrical impulses without gen external stimulation at all. Then you've got excitability. Some books may call this irritability as well. Essentially this is the cell's ability to respond to an electrical stimulus. And then conductivity. Think of the cardiac cells as a network of power lines that they've got to send the electrical conduction from one transformer to the other. How do they do that? Through the conduction of the transmission of electrical signals. So here's just a table showing these in general. Automaticity, you're going to see these at your nodal tissues and along your electrical conduction network. Uh, excitability, all, all cardiac cells have the ability uh, to receive an outside stimulus. Conductivity, all cardiac cells will conduct. And contractility, which again is a mechanical function of the myocardial cells. So in order for you to have a depolarization response, in order for the electrical uh, conduction cells to actually do what they're supposed to do, there's a huge role of electrolytes that plays in this. An electrolyte is a substance or compound whose molecules dissociate into charged components or ions when it produces a positive charge ion this is called a cation and charged ions that do not have a charge these are called anions your three major cations or positively charged ions that affect cardiac function include potassium sodium and calcium. Potassium performs a major function in the cardiac depolarization and repolarization cycle. Sodium is a vital part of the depolarization of the myocardium and then calcium it plays a huge function in the myocardial contraction. Magnesium and chloride are also important cations but for the purpose of this lecture we're going to focus primarily on sodium, potassium, and calcium. So in order for you to actually have a depolarization, you've got to move the, the ions from inside the cell to the outside of the cell and vice versa. A cell that's in its resting potential or at rest is negatively charged compared to the extracellular space. During the resting phase or the time when the cell is repolarized or polarized, potassium is greater inside of the cell and sodium is greater on the outside of the cell. How do these cells move 
or how do how do the cells actually get the sodium and potassium in and out this is through the sodium potassium exchange pump now there's also other types of protein gates or pumps on the cell as well that will help move other types of um, ions across such as calcium so again during the polarized or resting state the inside of the cell is electrically negative relative to the outside of the cell so in order for the cell to depolarize you've got to actually have a movement of the ions sodium has to come into the cell and potassium has to go out of the cell some very important terms that you need to know in relation to electrophysiology will include these threshold the threshold is the point at which the stimulus will produce a cell response all or none phenomenon. The stimulus is strong enough for the cardiac cells to reach a threshold. All cells will respond to the stimulus or none will respond. When a stimulus is strong enough for the cardiac cells to reach this threshold, it will actually start to produce an electrical conduction. At this point, all cells will respond to the stimulus and they will contract. This has to happen in order for the cells to contract in a synchium, which we will speak about in just a minute. What's important about the all or none is that cardiac cells work together. If they're not working together, then you've got something very wrong. So here's just a graphic of the cell. In this case, we're going to say it's a cardiac cell. If you note here that the outside of the cell is positively charged the inside of the cell is negatively charged it's saying it's around a negative 70 millivolts uh, anywhere from negative 70 up to negative 90 millivolts is the normal resting charge in which the cell must have in order to stay stable during this resting state or the polarized state extracellular sodium keeps the outside of the cell more positively charged than the inside of the cell where the potassium ions hang out. So in order for the cell to reach a point where it depolarizes, you've got to have a movement of sodium inside of the cell and potassium outside of the cell. Several more very important terms for you to know. Resting membrane potential. This is the state of a cardiac cell in which the inside of the cell membrane is negative compared with the outside of the cell membrane. This exists when the cardiac cells are in the resting state. Action potential. The action potential refers to the, the membrane and the movement of the ions inside and outside of the cell. This is a five phase cycle, which we'll talk about the phases uh, later in this lecture, that produce changes in the cell's membrane's electrical charge. This is caused by stimulation of myocardial cells, which extend across the myocardium, propagated in the all or none fashion. Synctium is really what has to occur. We've got to have a synctium. So everything needs to work together. The electrical conduction system needs to reach, the cell needs to reach its threshold, then it needs to actually respond to the stimulus and create a conduction in which that conduction is passed along to the other electrical cells, at which time those electrical cells will actually send a stimulus to the myocardial or the muscle tissue to actually contract. So synctium refers to cardiac muscle cell groups that are connected together and function collectively as a unit. Polarized state is a resting state of a cardiac cell, wherein the inside of the cell is electrically negative relative to the outside of the cell. Permeability refers to the cell membrane, which is the ability of the cell membrane to change through the process of active transport, the sodium potassium pump, the calcium protein pumps, and several different other types of pumps to allow for the movement of ions. If you recall, cell membranes are actually semi-permeable, which allows for fluid to freely move from the intracellular to the extracellular or vice versa in order to equilibrate the, the fluid content. That's not the case for the ions. The ions actually have to move inside and out of the cell through a process called active transport. Depolarization, the electrical occurrence normally expected to result in myocardial contraction. It involves the movement of ions across cardiac cell membranes resulting in positive polarity inside the cell membrane. Repolarization is a process whereby the depolarized cell is polarized and positive charges are again on the outside and negative charges on the inside of the cell. 
a return to the resting state. So if a cell is depolarized, basically think that the inside is positively charged with sodium and the outside in relation to the inside is more negative with potassium. And in order for the cell to reach its resting membrane potential or its polarized state, it has to go through the process of repolarization. Repolarization is going to refer to when sodium moves out and potassium moves in. The me mechanical pump in action of the heart can only occur in response to an electrical stimulus. Muscle fibers must be stimulated to contract. Remember, the process of automaticity, that only refers to the electrical cells of the heart. The electrical cells of the heart are able to, without a stimulus, perform a self-depolarization. That's automaticity. The mechanical cells or the muscle cells, they're not able to do that. They must receive an electrical stimulus in order to physically contract to cause the pumping action. When they receive the impulse, this causes the heart to beat because of a series of complex chemical changes within the myocardial cells. The myocardial cells are bathed in electrical electrolyte solutions. Extracellularly, again, is sodium. Intracellularly is potassium. And the chemical pumps, in this case, a sodium-potassium pump, help maintain the ion concentrations depending on what state it is in. So again, depolarization is a process of discharging resting cardiac muscle fibers by means of an electrical impulse that stimulates contraction. When the cell receives a stimulus from the conduction, the permeability of the cell wall changes to allow the sodium ions in. Think of it as the stimulus that activates the active transport of the sodium-potassium pump. When the sodium moves in, it makes the inside of the cell more positive. Depolarization spreads through the synctium, which causes the mechanical contraction and the pumping action. The pumping action, the mechanical contraction, can only occur if calcium ions enter the cell as well. So this is just a simple depiction of what we've been talking about for a few minutes now. During the polarized or the resting potential state, note that potassium is inside of the cell and sodium is outside of the cell. Well, what happens when this cell receives a stimulus to contract? Well, it reaches its threshold. At that point, it, it will stimulate the sodium-potassium pump to activate. And at a rate of three sodium ions to two potassium ions, you'll have sodium rapidly entering the cell and potassium moving out at a much slower rate. Once the sodium is reached and the inside of the cell has now reached its positive state, then the action potential has occurred and the process of depolarization has occurred. Once that's occurred, then the cell must get back to its repolarized state. The repolarized state allows for potassium to be back in the cell and it'll be more negatively charged and sodium will be outside of the cell and extracellularly you will see a, char a positive charge. So this is just an image of the sodium potassium pump which is showing that through the process of, of activation through the stimulus ATP must work on the, the pump to allow sodium in and potassium out and vice versa to get back to the depolarized state. Here's some more important terms to remember. Membrane potential. The rest of membrane potential is the resting state or the polarized state of the cell. Remember, the inside is negative and the outside is positive. And in order for an action potential to occur, you've got to have a change in polarity, which produces a change in cells, electrical charge caused by the stimulation of the myocardial cells. So how does this action potential actually occur?
The action potential at any point on the cell membrane acts as a stimulus to adjacent regions of the cell membrane. Remember, you've got to have a stimulus in order for the action potential to start, unless the cell has went through the process of automaticity. The action potential of a typical myocardial cell can be divided into five phases. Phase zero through phase four. You actually have on the cardiac contractile tissue, you have what's called fast potentials, and that's what we're going to talk about right now, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The slow potentials, they slow the influx of calcium and to a lesser extent sodium, which is responsible for automaticity or spontaneous depolarization. But right now, I want to focus on the fast potentials, which is found in the myocardial contractile tissue. So, this process that we're about to talk about right now has to occur in order for the myocardial contractile tissue to actually contract. These charts here that we're showing is actually showing that during the time of the QRS, during your ventricular contraction, this is phase zero. This is the point in which sodium rushes in, which causes the ventricular contraction. Now I mentioned the slow potential, and that's what's on the a, uh, SA node. Then, what you will notice here is that once you have a rush of sodium into the cell and you have contraction, then the rest of the time here, from phase 1 all the way to phase 4, this is going to be your time in which the cell is going back to its resting potential. So. Again, we're going to talk about the five phases of the cardiac action potential. If you're using the 8th edition, Nancy Caroline's Emergency Care in the Streets, this information can be found on page 969. The first phase, which is phase zero, during this phase, the, this phase begins when the cardiac muscle cell receives an impulse. It receives the stimulus. Sodium moves into the cell through the sodium channels, which causes the interior of the cell to become electrically positive relative to the exterior. This results in a charge to the transmembrane potential from negative 90 to about negative 70. Then it reaches its threshold and still more sodium channels allow a rapid influx of sodium. You've got to have a rapid influx of sodium during the next phase or during this phase in order for you to reach that action potential. What this is going to do is it's actually going to increase the inside of the cell from a negative 70 millivolt to a positive 30. At that point it's reached its threshold and now it's going to stimulate. Now calcium's moving but it's moving real slow through calcium channels. The influx of calcium causes a sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium for muscle contraction. Then the cell depolarizes and begins to contract, and on an ECG, the QRS complex of so the actual ventricular contraction indicates phase zero. Phase one, the cell begins to repolarize. So phase zero is your depolarization or your action potential, and then from phase one to phase uh four, you will actually start seeing the return to its resting potential. During phase one, inward sodium channels close and the cell begins to repolarize. Negatively charged chloride ions enter the cell and outward potassium channels open briefly. And during this time, you still do have a little bit of potassium leaking out of the cell because we want to try to maintain a little bit of a charge just long enough for the calcium to come in. During phase two, this phase is called the plateau phase, which is going to be the longest phase of the action potential. During this phase, sodium and calcium slowly enter the cells while potassium flows out of the cells. So the point here for the sodium to slowly enter the cell during the plateau phase is just to prolong the, the charge for just a moment. We're not trying to make the charge go higher, we're just trying to prolong the charge that we have just for a moment. The presence of calcium prolongs depolarization in the membrane creating a plateau. Then contraction ends when the outward flow of potassium it exceeds the inward flow of sodium and calcium. Phase 2 responds to the ST segment on the ECG. Then phase 3 which is the final phase of repolarization. Slow calcium channels close 
Calcium's moved out of the cell. Potassium channel is open. In the end of this phase, the membrane potential has been restored to its resting value. With repolarization complete, the cell now can respond to a new stimulus. On an ECG, the T wave represents phase 3, and then phase 4 is the actual resting phase. So let's look at it again, this time with the graphics. So phase 0, if you notice, the charge is negative 90 during the resting potential. So during this time, you've got to have a rapid increase of sodium into the cell. So during phase 0, sodium is rushing into the cell very quickly which rapidly increases the charge up to around positive 20 to 30 so at this point here you have now reached depolarization so the inside of the cell is more positive than the outside as positively charged ions flow into the cell the inside of the cell becomes positively charged compared with the outside leading to muscular contraction so phase zero really is the the contraction phase Next we have phase one. This is the early rapid repolarization phase. So if you notice here that it goes from a positive charge to zero rather quickly. Then phase two, which is your plateau or the time in which it maintains a charge. Calcium enters the myocardial cells. So you have calcium entering here. And this triggers a large secondary release of calcium from the intracellular storage sites and initiates contraction. So again, think of calcium in relation to myocardial contraction. You've got extracellular calcium that enters into the myocardial cells and through this, through different processes, this triggers the release of calcium stores within the cell. Phase 3, also known as the terminal phase, if you'll notice here, you've got a pretty rapid decrease in the charge. Results in the inside of the cell becoming negative. The membrane potential also returns to its resting state. This phase is initiated by closing of slow calcium channels and by increase in permeability uh, with the outflow of potassium. Repolarization is complete by the end of this phase. And then phase four is your resting membrane potential. So this is during the time when the cell is trying to rest. Just think of this as the cell trying to rest. The cell still has an excess of sodium inside and potassium outside and so now the sodium potassium pump has to be activated to get the rest of it out. To review on some terms, synctium, cardiac muscle cell groups that are connected together and function as a unit. You've got your atrial synctium and your ventricular synctium and your atria has to contract together and your ventricles have to contract together. And again, your polarized state, this is where the inside of the cell is potassium. The primary intracellular ion will be potassium and the primary extracellular uh, ion will be sodium. Refractory periods. So the cardiac muscle has a refractory period in which cells are incapable of repeating a particular action. When the cardiac cells cannot respond to any stimuli, stimulation, regardless of how long the stimulus is applied, this is referred to as the absolute refractory period. Then you have the relative refractory period, which is during the time in which the, the cardiac muscle cell may respond to stimulus, but it has not reached its full resting potential yet. So please keep in mind at what point the absolute refractory period occurs. The absolute refractory period is during the time which a ventricular contraction is, is occurring and when it starts to get back to its repolarized state. So the action potential, I mean the absolute refractory period, is at the start of the Q to the apex of the T wave. So the beginning of the Q to the apex of the T wave. Then you have your relative refractory period which then hits at the apex of the T wave and goes to the end there. So during this time, the myocardial cell may actually still respond to a stimulus. This is not good if it does.
So the first half represents the absolute refractory period, a period of time from phase zero to the middle phase three, in which the ventricles have not sufficiently repolarized to enable another depolarization. The second half represents the relative refractory period. This is the middle of phase three to the beginning of phase four, which indicates that some cells have repolarize sufficiently to depolarize again. Again, don't confuse this. They have repolarized sufficiently to where they can receive a stimulus, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have reached their full resting potential. So they're going to be very irritable. One of the big issues that you have is a phenomenon that we'll discuss more in detail, but the R on T phenomenon. So essentially what that means is that if the cardiac cell during the relative refractory period time receives a stimulus to contract, you're actually going to have ventricular contraction occur while it's trying to rest. So your R wave on your T wave. This can lead to very inefficient pumping and it can lead to cardiac arrest. So attempts to ensure muscles totally relaxed before another action potential of depolarization can be initiated um, occur in order for the cell to reach its full rest. Use this analogy here. In your own life, in order to go to work the next day and to be fully rested, you need your full resting time. You need to be able to, to get your full rest, your full sleep, and then you can wake up the next morning refreshed and ready. In a much very quicker fashion, this is the same thing with the cardiac cells, they must reach their full resting potential and have all of the, the intra and extracellular ions move back to where they need to be in order for you to have a successful depolarization. If this doesn't occur, then you can have lethal arrhythmias occur. So I like to think about the two stages of repolarization like a toilet. If you think of when you flush a toilet, Initially, if you flush a toilet and then you try to flush it again while it is still trying to flush out of the bowl, you're not going to be able to provide a stimulus. So the stimulus in this case is going to be the handle. You're not going to be able to actually create a full flush. During the absolute refractory period, that's the time after, right after you flush the toilet and you try to jiggle the handle and you cannot create a full flush again. During the relative refractory period, if you allow the toilet bowl to halfway filled, then you can jiggle the handle again and you can create a stimulus to flush, but it's not going to be a full flush. You're not going to get the full action that you need out of the toilet. And that's the same way with the relative refractory period. If you receive a stimulus to contract, uh, it will contract, but it's not going to be a good contraction. So in review, in order for the mechanical function of the heart to occur, you've got to have a working electrical conduction system. The electrical conduction system must produce a stimulus in order for the myocardial fibers of the myocardial cells to contract. This has to occur in a synchty. The SA node needs to create a conduction and then it must travel down the internodal pathways at which time the atria are both contracting at the same time. The AV node will then take that stimulus and slow it just a moment to allow for ventricular filling and then it will pass the conduction on through through the atrioventricular bundle down the bundle of His then to the right and left bundle branches, at which point you then will have fascicles, which then go into Purkinje fibers. All of this is from one stimulus at the SA node that allows for the full heart to contract. This action potential that we just described can be divided into five phases, zero through four, in which time you've got movement of ions from extracellular to intracellular to where you change the charge of the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. There's many things that can affect the electrical conduction system. It can be a physical issue with issues with the actual electrical conduction system itself, SA issues, AV node issues, things like that. Or it can actually be electrolyte imbalances such as hyperkalemia or high potassium, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypercalcemia or hypocalcemia. All of these will affect it. During the time from the start of the Q wave to the apex of the T wave, you have what's called the absolute refractory period. This is the time in which the myocardial cell cannot receive any type of outside stimulus. From the T wave to 
the start of the resting state of phase four from the peak of the T wave to the start of phase four, then you have the relative refractory period. During this time, you can actually have uh, outside stimulus occur. Again, this is not a good thing if a cell responds to an outside stimulus before it is completely rested. So this concludes the electrophysiology lecture. If you have any questions, please contact me, nickray at suscc.edu.